Welcome to Bible study, friends. It is day 270 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. Well, today we are in the book of Nehemiah still, where we are seeing the continuation or maybe even the completion of the building of the walls. Yesterday, we saw so much opposition for Nehemiah and his crew. And today, it's only going to continue. But we'll see how Nehemiah responds in the midst of all of the criticism. But before we get started, if you could please help us out by giving this video a thumbs up if this Bible study is helping you in your walk or in your journey with Christ. And if you are new here, please let us know where you are watching from. I highly recommend going back to day one of the videos. You can find the playlist in the description box below. But no matter where you begin or what video you come in on, God will always meet you where you're at because that is the way he is. If you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. Also, we are reading from the ESV translation. You can find all my Bible study tools also in the description box. And join us in our Facebook group if you want to be a part of a conversation that continues after the videos are done. So let's go ahead and pray and get into the word. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. We praise you. We honor you. We thank you. We look to you for everything that we need. God, you are the great I am. And so whatever it is that our hearts are carrying today, the load that we might have upon us, we place it at your feet right now because we want to come into this space with a clear mind, Lord, without all of the burdens. Jesus, you told us to cast our cares upon you, to give our burdens to you. So that is what we are doing today as we trust you in this time, Lord. As we open up your word, give us this day our daily bread, our daily nourishment, the spiritual nourishment that we need to go throughout our day, throughout our week. You know what is ahead of us, God. You know exactly what it is that we will be facing. And so I just pray that you will strengthen us today in that. We pray for wisdom. We pray for discernment. And we pray for strength on our hands, Lord, to carry out the work that you've called us to do. Please forgive us of our sins as we also forgive those who have sinned against us. If we have gone wrong or we've gone off the beaten path and we don't even realize it, Lord, will you bring it to our minds? Will you help us to realize where we may have erred? And I pray that you will also help us to get it right. If we need to go to somebody and ask for forgiveness, Lord, will you place that on our heart? Will you convict our hearts, O Holy Spirit? We give you full permission to do that today, to convict us where we may need to to be corrected and we know that within that God you will only strengthen us so thank you for that also please don't let us be led into temptation keep the enemy far from us Lord as we start to do your work today's work Lord the enemy is not going to be happy about it we know it and so we just pray that you keep him far from us for yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever we give it all back to you Lord we yield it to you in the name of Jesus amen so starting off here in chapter six, once again, the work is almost completed. So it's kind of like a now or never for both Nehemiah and the enemy who is going to try to stop them from completing the work. Now, when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors and the gates. Well, the doors are an important part of the gates. We definitely need those to be set up. Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come and let us meet together at Hakafirim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm, and I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. So notice that these are the same guys who were once jeering at him, making fun of him, intimidating him, and now they're like, hey, hey, let's be friends. Why don't you come and take a load off? So they're basically trying to form this fake alliance with him trying to isolate him in a sense and get him distracted from the work. That's their plan. So the enemy has changed his tactics. If what he was trying to do before doesn't work, he's going to do something else. So that's exactly what is happening because of course the external attacks and also the internal depression didn't work. So now he had to try something else. But I love his response. He's like, uh-uh, I'm doing a great work. So he keeps his eyes focused on the work that he needs to do. And this will happen with us. If we stay busy doing the Lord's work, we ain't got time for the enemy's nonsense. So stay focused, just like Nehemiah did. And so he continues, why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way. So they are persistent in their attempt to get him to stop working in this way. And I answered them in the same manner. So he was just as persistent. The enemy's gonna be persistent. Well, we need to be persistent right back and resist the devil so that he can flee. In the same way, Sanballat for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, 
It is reported among the nations and Geshem and also says it that you and the Jews intend to rebel. So isn't that funny how he says it is reported among the nations? Basically trying to say, you know, everybody knows this is a very popular lie. But even though a lie is popular, it is still a lie because that is not their plan. Their plan is not to rebel. And so that is another change tactic. He's now switching to accusation. That is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you also wish to become their king. And of course, that is not his intention. He never set out to do this for a reward. He's simply doing this as unto the Lord. So here we see false accusation. They're trying to ruin his reputation. And the thing is, the enemy always knows which accusations are going to hurt the worst. He knows our soft spots. He knows our insecurities. He knows exactly what to say to try to defeat us. And that is what he's trying to do here. And you also have set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah, and now the king will hear of these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. Then I sent to him saying, no such things as you say have been done. So he's like, lies. This is all a lie. For you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will be done. But now, O God, strengthen my hands. So just as he did in the past when the enemy came against him, he goes back to prayer, the most important weapon that he could have at this point. Incredible. Keep that in mind. When the enemy comes against you, pray. Now, when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deleah, son of Mehetabel, who confined to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple for they are coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you by night. So now they're straight up lying to him once again now trying to get him to go into the temple. But the thing is, is that the only people who could go into the temple are the priests. And Nehemiah is not a priest. So they are trying to entrap him. They are now trying to discredit him via religious deception. They're using this form of religious flattery to get him to sin so that they can then discredit his ministry and get people not to follow him. The enemy will do that. He'll try to dig up all that he can to get people to unfollow you, to get people to not believe in you because of what you have done in the past. That's why I said from the beginning, if you're looking for somebody who's perfect, this is not the place to be. I am not your girl because I am by no means perfect, never have been, never will be. But I love Jesus and I love him with all my heart. And I love his word and I love getting people to love his word. So if that is enough for you, then I'm your girl. All right. So again, he switched his, the way he was doing things, the enemy did, to now incrimination. And he's trying to incriminate him. All right. Uh, verse 11. But I said, should such a man as I run away? So he's like, listen, I'm a governor subject to the king. I am not supposed to be one who is fearful. I am not going to run away. And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? So he knows, you know, he could smell the rat. He knows that they are trying to rise up against him. And he's like, mm, yeah, no. <laughs> my husband always does that to my daughter. You want some? Mm, no. I will not go in. And I understood. So there it is. He shows that he had discernment. He had wisdom and saw that God had not sent him. I love this because discernment is such a gift of the Holy Spirit. It is something that is so important for us to have. It is something we got to pray for sometimes. You know, Lord, give us the discernment. Give us the wisdom. Discernment is the ability to see good where others may not be able to see it or may miss it. And it is also the ability to see bad where others are deceived. And so that was the case for Nehemiah here. He was the people were trying to deceive him and he's like, oh, no, no, no. I call you on what you're doing. I see what you're up to. And so how can we then strengthen our discernment? Well, here are some ways. One, the most important way is to see things through the eyes of God. That's the first and foremost way to be able to have and develop your discernment to see things through God's eyes. How do we do that? Well, we got to know his character. How do we do that? Reading his word. Second, we develop spiritual maturity, again, through reading the word, through having relationship and fellowship with him and with other Christians, because a baby will stick anything in its mouth. 
You know, it'll take on anything. It'll pick up anything off the floor and shove it in its mouth. Even puppies. My dog last night, I woke up at 11 and I've been up since 11. It's now, I don't know, 7, 11. Been up since 11 o'clock last night because my dog was eating a package of dried mango. And my husband woke up and was like, she's eating something. She's like a baby. <laughs> Put anything in her mouth. And third, you got to ask for it because again, it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. You can read about those gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you want to know more about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, of course, we will be covering the New Testament in just a couple more days. I'm so excited. Oh, I just feel like it's going to go by so fast. Okay, so he had discernment, he had wisdom, and he operated in it. Verse... Let's go back to verse 12. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. So he knows now that it is a conspiracy and that he is working for these fools. For this purpose, he was hired that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin. And so they could then give me a bad name in order to taunt me. So remember Tobiah and Sanballat, Sanballat, oh my God. So here he puts Sanballat and Tobiah in the hands of God. He commits them to him and says, I'm going to wash my hands of them. You deal with them according to these things that they have done. And also the prophetess, Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. So, so many lessons to be learned here in this chapter. We'll continue here at the end of chapter six, verse 15. And so the wall was finished against overwhelming odds, of course. I mean, he dealt with a lot. He first had grief. He was having to be in prayer over it. He had to plan it out. He had to have bold faith, he faced opposition, intimidation, incrimination, discreditation. And then he asked for the strength, though, to be able to continue in the work and finish it. And he did. And he was able to do so because of the fact that he had that discernment and he was able to stay focused on what the task was that was most important. So it was finished on the 25th day of the month, Elul. And by the way, this was only 52 days from the time that he had started building. It took him 52 days, a little over a month and a half is what it took them or around a month and a half. And so if you think about that, it was lying in ruins for hundreds of years but it only took 52 days for them to rebuild the walls. This is how it is with us. You know, God will choose just one person to rebuild or reestablish or to do amazing work. And it can happen in an instant. You know, he'll choose someone, he'll activate them, they'll be obedient in it, and they will start to do the work that might have been lying in ruins for many, many years. And why was he able to accomplish it so quickly? It's because he had prayed longer than the actual work. He was in prayer for four months. So that just goes to show that the battle is spiritual more than it is physical. So this was in 52 days. And when all of our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. So others are noticing and others see God's hand upon them. And so they're afraid. Now, our lives should also do this. It shouldn't make people scared, but it should make people fear God. When people see the hand of God on your life, it should bring them to a place of respect and awe and wonder over your God if they don't know him. So hopefully your life does. Verse 17, moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah and Tobiah's letters came to them. So during this whole time that we were just reading about, they're talking about these letters that were being sent back and forth. And these were like personal letters. And the intention of these letters were probably to entrap Nehemiah or to intimidate him. Because let's see what happens. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him because he was the son-in-law of Shechemiah, the son of Ara. And his son, Hohanan, had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, as his wife. So Tobiah had married a Jewish woman. Also, they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him. So they were trying to trick him even here, it seems like, through these letters. They were saying, hey, look at all of the good stuff that he's doing. And then they wanted to see how Nehemiah was going to respond to that knowing that he had risen up against him basically and they were going to go back and tattle and Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid now the best thing about this whole situation here is that it was written because it happened Nehemiah made note of it 
but we will hear of this story and this situation no more. Now, if you are working for the kingdom in any way, shape, or form, whether it's just coming here to read the word so you can build up your knowledge or wisdom, you can become a better person, you are working for the kingdom because even your character and the change in it from glory to glory will be on display for others to see. And so therefore you are working for the kingdom. Now, anytime that happens, remember when I said it's in the doing that the enemy becomes afraid. You're going to rack up some credits with him for him to come and intimidate you and try to get you to stop. He'll try to whisper lies into your ear. He'll try to tell you that you have the wrong motives. And if all of that doesn't work, he may even try flattery the way that these guys did. Hey, why don't you come have a little party with us? Why don't you come hang out with us? It's just one weekend. It's just one night. No big deal. He'll use people in situations where you may have your guard down. So be careful of flattery. Be careful when people are making you feel real good because that's when the enemy loves to swoop on in and tear you back down. So then what do we do? We stay focused. We stay focused on the task. We stay focused on the Lord. We stay focused on the word and we be about the kingdom's business. Because when we're about the kingdom's business, when we're about God's business, we won't have time for the nonsense of the enemy. So don't listen to his lies. Don't answer him. Don't engage. Instead, be like Nehemiah who had that gift of discernment and he used it wisely. And if I'm being honest here, I never get excited when I read about opposition because I feel like, oh boy, <laughs> it's coming, you know, and I feel like this is the Lord preparing me. Be wise, hold your tongue, don't answer them. And sure enough, this morning I wake up to comment, you know, and so it's just, it is what it is and it's going to happen because we're about the kingdom's business. Let's move on to chapter seven. Now, when the wall had been built and I had set up the doors and the gatekeepers, the singers and the Levites had been appointed. So we see him now delegating responsibility out. And I love that these are some of the people that he first brings up to the task, which are the singers and the Levites who led worship. So he's reestablishing worship once again. Every victory in our lives should push us deeper into worship, deeper into praise for our God. So he had a victory. He's reestablishing that worship. And I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the governor of the castle charge over Jerusalem, for he was more faithful and God-fearing man than many. So remember, Hanani was the one who came to him and said, hey, brother, our walls are in disrepair. They are in rubble. And so he is a faithful man and he is a fearful man of God. So faith plus the fear of God, those two things are so necessary for effective work of God. Let's say you've got all the talent in the world. You've got all of these amazing natural gifts, but you don't fear the Lord and you don't have faith. That work that you might put to the plow is not going to be as effective as someone who may not be as talented, but who answers the call, who is faithful and who is humble before the Lord. God will choose that person all day long over the one who is naturally talented and who is not submitted, who is prideful or who may not be listening to what God is telling him to do. So be like Hanani, faith and have fear of God. Verse three, and I said to them, let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. Why? Because they were probably trying to avoid any kind of surprise attack at sunrise. That was a lot of the times when these uh, enemies would come and try to attack them because it would be finishing off the night. They would just be waking up. They would be vulnerable. They'd open up the gates and then in comes the enemy and plunders. And while they are still standing guard, so this is this civil defense system that they kind of got set up here. So we need to set this up in our own lives. Set the guards. Let them shut and bar the doors. Appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, some at their guard posts and some in front of their own homes. Now this was very wise for him to put people in front of their own homes because instead of just placing them in posts around the city, if you put them in front of their own homes, they're going to be way more likely to defend the city. They're going to defend their home first and therefore passionately defend the city as they work together. So that was a wise move. The city was wide and large, but the people within it were few and no houses had been rebuilt. So this is really sad here. Nehemiah is taking inventory of what is going on 
population is very small. And so he needs to, in a sense, take a census so he knows who he has in this nation and how it's going to look a little bit later. Now, these are the same names that we saw in Ezra chapter 2. And these are all of the people who had returned from exile. So he's taking the census of who is in the land. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. And I found the book of genealogy of those who came up at the first, and I found written in it, These were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried into exile. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his town. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Rehemiah, Nehemani, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mizpireth, Bigvi, Nehem, and Baana. Now the number of the men of the people of Israel, the sons of Perosh, 2,172, The sons of Shephatiah, 372. The sons of Ara, 652. Sons of Peath, Moab, namely the sons of Jeshua and Joab, 2,818. The sons of Elam, 1,254. The sons of Zatu, 845. The sons of Zakai, 760. Sons of Benui, 648. The sons of Bebi, 628. The sons of Asgad, 2,322. The son of Adonikam, 667. The sons of Bigvi, 2,067. The sons of Aden, 655. The sons of Ader, namely Hezekiah, 98. The sons of Hashem, 328. The sons of Bezai, 324. The sons of Harif, 112. Sons of Gibeon, 95. The men of Bethlehem and Netopha, 188. The men of Ananoth, 128. The men of Beth Asmaveth, 42. The men of Kiriath Jerim, Kephira, and Beeroth, 743. The men of Ramah and Geba, 621. The men of Michmas, 122. The men of Bethel and Ai, 123. The men of the other Nebo, 52. The sons of the other Elam, 1,254. The sons of Haram, 320. The sons of Jericho, 345. Sons of Lod, Hated, and Ono, 721. And the sons of Senea, 3,930. Now the priests, the sons of Judea, namely the house of Jeshua, 973, sons of Immer, 1,052, sons of Pasher, 1,247, and the sons of Haram, 1,017. The Levites, the sons of Jeshua, namely Cadmiel, and the sons of Hodiva, 74. The singers, the sons of Asaph, 148. The gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, the sons of Ader, the sons of Talman, the sons of Akab, the sons of Hatita, and the sons of Shobai, 138. The temple servants, the sons of Ziha, the sons of Hasufa, the sons of Tebaoth, the sons of Kiros, the sons of Sia, the sons of Paden, the sons of Labana, the sons of Hageba, the sons of Shalmai, the sons of Hanan, the sons of Giddel, the sons of Gehar, the sons of Rhea, the sons of Reason, the son of Nikoda, the sons of Gaza, the sons of Uzza, the sons of Pesea, the sons of Besai, the sons of Munum, the sons of Nefushisim, the sons of Bakbuk, the sons of Hakufa, the sons of Harher, the sons of Basleth, the sons of Mahida, sons of Harsha, sons of Barcos, sons of Sisera, sons of Tima, sons of Neziah, and the sons of Hatipha. Again, these were the temple servants. And all the temple servants and the sons of Solomon's servants were 392. Now the following were those who came up from Telmila, Telharsha, Kirib, Adon, Immer, but they could not prove their father's houses nor their descent whether they belong to Israel or not. The sons of Deleah, the sons of Tobiah, the sons of Nakoda, 642. Also the priests, the sons of Hobeah, the sons of Hakaz, the sons of Barzillai, who had taken a wife of the daughters of Barzillai the Gileadite and was called by their name. Uh Uh-oh. These sought their registration among those enrolled in the genealogies, but it was not found there. So they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor told them that they were not to partake of the most holy food until a priest with Urim and Thummim should arise. Verse 66. The whole assembly together was 42,360, besides their male and female servants, of whom were 7,337. And they had 245 singers, male and female. Their horses were 736, their mules 245, and their camels 435, and their donkeys 6,720. Remember, donkeys were the humble 
car. For 70, now some of the heads of the father's houses gave to the work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 derricks of gold, 50 basins, 30 priest garments, and 500 minas of silver. And some of the heads of the father's houses gave into the treasury of the work, 2,000 derricks of gold, 2,200 minas of silver. And what the rest of the people gave was 20,000 derricks of gold, 2,000 minas of silver, and 67 priest garments. So the priests, the Levites, gatekeepers, singers, some of the people, the temple servants, and all Israel lived in their towns. And when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. Whew, sections of genealogy are always so hard to get through. I know all the years of my life that I was studying the Bible on my own, I would skip those sections or I would skim read through them. I never even attempted to say the names, let alone understand where they came from and where they were even going. But I love that we have chosen to dig in and to understand the context of the Bible, where we're at, what the time frame is, who it's happening to, and just to see that this chapter ended with the people of God in their rightful place. Because that's what God is all about. He's all about the people. Everything he does is for people. He does everything out of love for his children, love for the people of the earth, desiring for every single one to come to repentance. And the fact that he mentioned this genealogy twice in the Bible, that these guys had their name written in the best-selling book of all time twice, well, that just goes to show how important they were to God, how important each person is to God, because we don't know who these people are. Their names mean nothing to us, but we know that they matter in the heart of God. And it gives us a hope that we too matter so much to the heart of God. He loves you. He cares about you. He cares about your well-being. He cares about your comings. He cares about your goings. He cares about your future. And he most importantly cares about your eternity. That is why he calls upon our name time after time after time. He whispers to us. He invites us to come back home. It's because he loves you. He is all about his relationship with you. So we thank you for that, Lord, for that reminder today of how much you truly love us. If anyone is out there that can't feel that love, where it's not tangible to them, maybe they don't understand it yet, they can't feel it quite yet. Oh God, I pray that you will give them a physical touch, Lord. I pray that you will touch them in such a way right now in the name of Jesus, that they say, I feel you, I hear you, I know you're here with me. I believe now, Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving me that faith because there are people who are hurting out there, Lord. There are people, Lord, who need you more than ever. And so, God, I pray that you will strengthen them right now, that you will comfort them, that you will surround them with your peace and your love. Let them know, God, that you have such an amazing purpose for their life and that you are doing mighty things within them and that they are where they are supposed to be in this exact moment. It is not an accident that they clicked on this video. It is not an accident that they are in this community. It is not an accident. You don't work that way, oh God. You appointed this time. You appointed this space. You appointed this very message on this very day with this person who is watching right now. You purposed it. So we thank you for that, Lord. We love you so much and we're so grateful to be able to see you continue to rebuild, to restore, to replenish, to heal. Help us, Lord, to be active servants, partnering with you to be able to help others, to be able to do the work, to be able to be your hands, your feet, and your mouthpiece. And as we face the days ahead, Lord, if there is any sort of opposition, criticism, the enemy trying to intimidate us, trying to come against us, trying to get us to quit, will you remind us of this word, Lord? Will you remind us what you had spoken to us, the promise that you placed into our spirit, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will bring it back to memory so that we say, ah, this is the moment that that word was for. That's how you work, oh God, and we thank you for your faithfulness in that. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I wanna give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. 
So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer. I'm gonna put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.